Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we're we're going to sort of chat here for a little bit and make hello, sure hello. make sure we give everyone a chance to sign in and log on. Um, Christine, you want to talk a little bit about what we're doing tonight? Oh yeah, just just we decided that we wanted to have some conversations. Um, and next month, you'll well, we're going to be bringing in Elizabeth Lucas and some other young. Um, and by young, we mean under five years old theater companies and how they're doing and what are some of the challenges about being in the pandemic when you're young compared to when you've been around and that's challenging for all, but we're just gonna kind of focus on that. And today, um, Aaron brought an amazing, exciting guest to just kind of talk about a topic that's really near and dear to all of us in theater right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really excited about this new program that we're starting this, um, what we're calling Conversations, Endangered Species Theater Project Conversations, in which we'll talk, we'll, we'll basically every month or so, right, Christine? We'll, we'll, that's what we're going to aim for. We're going to aim for. <laughs> um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bring in someone who can who can talk to us about a, an issue that is important to us, whether it's specifically related to art and art creation, whether it's something related to um, social justice concerns that we're interested in, all these type of things. We're 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 just really invested in using our company to have these conversations, and so um, we're ex incredibly excited to have our guest here this evening. So our guest tonight for the very first uh, Endangered Species Cedar Project conversation is Dr. William Allen. And Dr. William Allen is currently the Sophie M. Libman NEH Professor of Humanities and Visiting Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Hood College. Before coming to Hood, he received a PhD in philosophy from the University of Memphis, and he served as a lecturer at Morgan State University. Uh, at Hood, he runs the Humanities Colloquium He's on the African American Studies Advisory Board, and a fun fact that I learned while digging uh, digging around in the internet about Dr. Allen is that he is a vinyl record enthusiast and has over one thousand records in his collection, which is something I really want to talk to you about, Dr. Allen, because <laughs> I I have a couple <laughs> records, but that's impressive. <laughs> I have some Beatles albums. <laughs> <laughs> we are very excited to have him here in our, as our first guest in this ongoing series, Endangered Species Theater Projects Conversations. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. William Allen. Thank you, Aaron, for uh, inviting me. Uh, I have a very low profile uh, on the net, and of all the things you can find, you found that uh, I collect vinyl. I find it kind of funny. <laughs> my, my mark is uh, very small uh, on the internet. Uh, so yeah, uh, so we're going to discuss uh, white privilege, and um, in terms of talking about race in general, uh, we live in a society with a culture where uh, this is something that is very uncomfortable for people to talk about. Um, but given uh, things that happened in, you know, during the summer with uh, Black Lives Matter and then uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, this sort of conversation has come to the forefront uh, along with um, systematic uh, in, in, uh, um, injustice and uh, matters related to that. Um, I'm going to take a sort of different approach. So one, I'm a philosophy scholar. And so I'm going to approach this from philosophy on the one hand, but also I'm going to sort of address uh, misconceptions about what white privilege is. So from purely a sort of social and political justice perspective, uh, so this will be activists and uh, other individuals, uh, they, they will talk about white privilege and sort of stress that uh, it requires, you know, action, you know, from from whites because uh, white privilege is sort of in a category of an injustice, and so my talk is going to encompass that. But I think before we can even get to the topic of uh, you know social and sort of you know or racial justice, uh, we have to first understand what it is. So here, just sort of give you a preview of what I'm going to do here. Um, on the one hand, I'm going to sort of discuss you know what I perceive as some misconceptions of uh, white privilege. And the philosophical part is going to come in and that this is a really good topic uh, because philosophy, and so for those of you who may have had a, a philosophy 101 class uh, at some point or some exposure to philosophy, you know that in the Greek philosophy translates into uh, level wisdom. So fundamental philosophy is sort of questioning our assumptions that we have about ourselves um, and about the world we live in. And so here in terms of, say, self-knowledge, knowledge about others, 
that a knob of the society we live in, you know, that's they say very fundamental to uh, doing uh, philosophy. So that is going to be sort of a focus in terms of um, my um, uh, little talk here. Um, and so what this means is, is that you know here we're going to talk about you know what it is to be white, particularly in America, but also what it means to be non-white uh, in, in America. You can't talk about one you know, without, without the other. Okay. Uh, so originally I had a little PowerPoint to show you guys, but we had some uh, you know, technical uh, difficulties, and I'm, I'm assuming much of it was probably from my end more than anything. Uh, but uh, here I have a definition of white privilege that I'm going to read you guys. And it's, it's from Webster's, but it's um, an amended definition. So I sort of added some things. And so in reading it, I was uh, kind of surprised that there's a couple of uh, words that was excluded. So from um, Webster's dictionary there, uh, it says, well, uh, my minute version of it, is the set of social, political, economic, and psychological advantages that white people have by virtue of their race and a culture characterized by racial uh, inequality. And what was excluded from the Webster definition is political and psychological. And I was particularly sort of surprised that they only had social and economic, it didn't include political, uh, given uh, you know, the history. So we go back to say the Jim Crow laws, you know, that certainly was a case where uh, the, you had, the whites had a political advantage you know, embedded in, in law. Um, but also what I had there was uh, psychological, that one of the things I'm gonna talk about is that there is sort of a, a psychological disadvantage and a psychological uh, advantage for whites, psychological disadvantage for blacks, uh, it, it, that, that's sort of been embedded in, in our society. That say one of the things that uh, whites have to sort of worry about is whether or not uh, I am a full citizen that, or whether or not uh, I am viewed as fully human. And that is something that's been an issue for here, I'm talking about African-Americans uh, throughout the history here in America. And um, this sort of relates to reasons why you see athletes taking the knee or somebody like my aunt who teaches public school in Mississippi that when um, they say, well, yeah, yeah, you, she's a part-time teacher. So, so when they're required to say the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, she refuses to say it. And so here, in terms of even thinking about you know, what it is to sort of be American, um, or even say what it is to be human, uh, that's something that I don't think whites have to sort of, uh, sort of have, to, have to deal with, uh, just you know, living here in America. So psychological is an additional sort of, uh, psychological advantage is something additional that I think is important to include in that definition. All right. Uh, so here I had a, a list of misconceptions about uh, white privilege. And before I, I shall start here, so, you know, uh, some of this is, this is some stuff that I've sort of surmised. Uh, also, I should say that, you know, uh, my discussion here is not to be comprehensive and sort of a full, you know, full sort of discussion of, of white privilege and different people, say in different uh, disciplines, or if you're an activist, may have a different sort of take on this. Uh, but here I'm going to start with some misconceptions of white privilege, and then through that sort of discuss what I think you know, white privilege sort of entails. All right. Uh, so number one here is is that uh, white uh, privilege claims that all whites have it easy and are not subject disadvantages. So that's the first sort of um, uh, misconception I think there. Uh, even people who sort of write about this, and here I should probably mention that uh, Peggy McIntosh. Uh, in her article, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack in 1988. Uh, that's sort of a, a contemporary article, a relatively contemporary article, uh, that sort of sort of you know, really kicked off this debate. Uh, we can actually trace the term white privilege back to W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, but you know, she, and I'm going to refer to her list of white privileges here in a second, but you know, she's sort of considered sort of popularly uh, the person who sort of you know, kicked off use of this term. Uh, some people may have heard of Tim Wise. He wrote a book, uh, White Like Me. So he's an even more contemporary person who sort of talks about this. Uh, but yeah, so going back to the first misconception here is that you know somehow whites have it easy in the United States. So people such as Peggy McIntyre say that is completely not a, you know in, 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 not about this. That there's sort of an intersection of different disadvantages. So for instance, I can see say if I'm a poor white and then I hear the term white privilege that I would say, 
oh, well, you, you know, without understanding what the term means, that, you know, if I'm a poor, just let's say white person, I would say, wait a minute, you know, I, I'm struggling to make ends meet on a daily basis, and I'm being told that I have some sort of privilege by being white. Um, I do not, you know, uh, see, you know, see, see how that's the case. Well, um, we're not denying that, that in terms of being poor and there's some sort of economic disadvantage that poor whites have. And we say that's class privilege. So here, in terms of talking about uh, white privilege, and this leads to another sort of misconception, not denying that there are sort of other disadvantages out there. But even if you're a poor white, you still have a, dis a advantage by being white. And I've sort of already sort of talked about some of this, that in terms of how you sort of perceive yourself as a citizen, that even if I'm a poor white, um, you can say, well, I have some sort of sense of belonging to America that I don't have this sort of history of mistreatment and oppression that sort of you know, makes me sort of doubt whether or not I can be considered even American or even um, in terms of just being fully human, that I can be sort of relatively secure that I'm, you know, a, that I'm you know, the white person, yeah, that I'm sort of fully human. Um, in terms of African-Americans, and then we say other groups as well too, um, have had a struggle with this. Okay, uh, and then also just some other things that say disadvantages as far as particularly being African-American um, I don't want to exclude other non-whites, but um, here, just to be just to be upfront, um, my my sort of focus is on the African-American experience. But I'll, I'll I'll try to include you know a, a other groups as well too. But here, particularly in terms of say indicators of wealth, health, education, um, African-Americans and say and Latinos are sort of at the bottom you know of the of the list. And something in particular, I have been um, very interested in. Uh, which some of you may have heard of, is weathering. And this is the case where uh, medical professionals have uh, found that just merely being a person of African descent in America and experiencing you know, your racism and being in that environment uh, leads to increased health risks. And it's not just being of, of African descent, it's being African descent living here in America, that the studies have shown that um, you know, in Africa, they don't have the same sort of elements, and that when Africans leave Africa and sort of you know, you know, immigrate here to, to America, they develop the same sort of health ailments that uh, native Af you know, uh, African peoples uh, have, have encountered. So that's something that, say, the poor white you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have to, to uh, contend with. Okay. Um, the second misconception is that white privilege is about making white people feel guilty about being white. Um, Peggy McIntosh and others have said, you know, certainly that this is not the case, that in terms of, say, any sort of white guilt, that doesn't uh, solve the problem. Um, if anything, we would say there's some sort of moral imperative uh, here, is that you should be aware of white privilege, and then that's the first thing, and then uh, you should, certainly shouldn't exploit it and sort of, you know, purposely use your advantages um, in order to help to better yourself, because that it has sort of consequences you know, in terms of how the treatment of uh, non-whites, or say even you know refusing and just ignoring it altogether. That hey, I'm aware of it, but I'm just going to go ahead and ignore it. And then this is where the social and political justice come th thing comes in. That by ignoring it, not recognizing it, um, you're just sort of aiding in terms of perpetuating the disadvantages that um, you know non-whites have. Okay. And we can discuss any of these further um, in the question and answer uh, section there. Uh, the third sort of misconception is that white privilege exists in the past, but doesn't today. And this is, sort of, of course, goes along with that, hey, racism you know, doesn't exist. Um, and here I'm thinking way back to when Obama was president. And uh, a lot of people said, oh, OK, with election Obama, we live in a post-racial society. Uh, for those of us who are uh, academics, at least, I'll say at least, and who study uh, racial injustice, uh, you know, that, that was just completely ridiculous. And considering things that's occurred over the past president, I don't think that the uh, sort of conception that we live in a post-racial uh, society is as popular as it was. Um, but no, you know, uh, in terms of white privilege, even racism, uh, I think we have some obvious examples that still exist. So particularly in the treatment of police, I think that over the past year, that's something that has become uh, very much publicly accepted that in terms of um, uh, blacks being uh, treated very differently uh, by the police than, uh, than whites. 
And just some statistics here that, hey, if you're uh, African-American uh, or African descent, it's three times higher that you'll be killed by a police officer uh, unarmed. If you're an unarmed black person, you'll be three times likely to be killed by police than someone who's white. And then there's other statistics you know, dealing with the wealth gap. Uh, the wealth gap is partly due to race. Again, it, it's not just merely race, that here we can bring in class and uh, having lack of access to information and um, healthcare and things like that. All those things are, are going to be related, but you know, again, they're all tied together in terms of race. And something I wanted to add I think also this sort of conception that white privilege doesn't exist, this sort of fiction, and, or racism doesn't exist, it also sort of tied into how we sort of think about ourselves, um, particularly living in the Western world, if not to say particularly in living in America, that we, we live in a very uh, individualistic society. And associated with that is sort of um, an ahistorical conception of the self, where I can view myself outside of the connection to history that, hey, in terms of my accomplishments, that I did this. Um, in terms of who I am and my personality and identity, I sort of formed it on my own outside of my community or history. And so in terms of white privilege, um, it says, no, you need to think of the self in a historical context that in terms of your family, your community, the nation that you're born in, all these things help shape who you are. And with it, it sort of provides you a framework in order to achieve what you have. Um, here, leading, we're going to white privilege here, is that if we talk about things such as materially in terms of wealth, uh, it's generational. So, you know, the, you know, the sociology says, as I said, that there's been, the, the territory of the wealth gap is partly due to the fact that blacks have been disadvantaged uh, for so long that we have sort of, you know, a late start. Um, but also uh, here I can add that in, in terms of say other factors uh, such as health, um, incarceration of, of groups, things like that, all these things have has historical context, and we can't just sort of sort of take them outside of it and uh, just blame the individual. That hey, this you know these individuals are poor, or we have such a high such a high rate of African Americans in prison. That hey, just due to these are sort of you know bad apples or you know bad actors or whatever. Uh, that this historical context is sort of feeding into it. And here I don't want to eliminate uh, the you know, sort of individualism, but we have also sort of recognized that we're sort of shaped by um, our sort of material circumstances that we're born into. Um, and this entails, you know, economic repercussions, uh, psychological repercussions, legal, etc. Okay. The uh, fourth misconception here that I have and I've kind of already talked about this. Uh, so this is that white privilege is only about race and ignores other types of advantages, disadvantages. Uh, this is not the case. So from what I've seen, the people who are actually activists uh, and for, for racial justice, they also can, you know, concerned with uh, class injustice, um, you know, gender, things like that. And all these things are intersectional. So even in terms of talking about uh, white privilege and uh, advantages whites have versus disadvantages non-whites have. Well, it, it, it's, it's not all uh, you know, nice and neat. And we just say we just put it in a racial context that, yes, we are going to bring in class, uh, we're going to, you know, sexual identity, uh, gender, things like that. Um, so, for instance, uh, if I were a poor uh, black female who was also homosexual, um, there's certain a list of disadvantages that are very different from myself being a a black um, you know, heterosexual male uh, who is, I guess I'm considered you know, middle class. Uh, but yeah, yeah. so here we don't want to sort of exclude uh, talking about white privilege or white advantage and or you know, non, you know, dis disadvantages from say other types as well too. There, there's a sort of intersection of, of, of these things. Okay. Uh, lastly here, I just want to jump into a couple. I'm not going to read all of them. But uh, in terms of Peggy McIntosh's article, and some of this is dated, so I was very selective in which ones I cho chose here. And in terms of Peggy McIntosh, uh, she basically was, I believe she was an English professor um, back then, and she just sort of you know, wrote an article in terms of talking to her um, colleague, uh, African American colleagues, and uh, came up with this list. 
And so there's some things that we say is still relevant uh, uh, and some things that are actually missing that I'm going to sort of add afterwards. But here I'll just do a couple of them that in terms of white privileges, according to uh, Peggy McIntosh in uh, 1988 here. Um, so one, uh, this is what well, is number four. Uh, number four is that uh, whites have the privilege to go into a store without being followed. Okay. Uh, I know particularly as being a uh, young African male living in um, urban Boston during the time period or whatever, that was something that was, that was, that was common. Uh, here, her number two here is redlining. So redlining is basically housing discrimination in which uh, blacks are steered into black neighborhoods or denied uh, loans for homes. And this occurs not only with realtors, but also um, you know, HUD in terms of you know, giving housing uh, to African-Americans where it can be accused of this as well too. Um, I actually have a relative who dealt with a realtor where it seemed to be a case of redlining uh, when she was trying to move from Boston to, I think it was North Carolina. And she chose the realtor uh, being a Christian woman. She, she, she said she chose a realtor just because she said, hey, she was Christian. And the, the woman basically took her to uh, a, a lot of like really, really you know crappy homes. And um, the relative I'm thinking of, she actually had a list of homes that she wanted to see that were in white neighborhoods and she refused to take her. And I had to explain to her that, you know, hey, that's basically just red line. And, just, and this is the whole discussion. Just because somebody said they're pretty Christian doesn't mean that you can trust them. Okay, so yeah. So uh, number two there. Uh, number six, uh, white, white privilege here is uh, you'll be assumed to ask or speak for all members of one one's race. And so here I've kind of already sort of addressed this, that, hey, you know, this is my sort of take on white privilege, and I'm certainly no sort of spokesperson for all whites. <coughs> Uh, number 22, uh, do, you do, uh, you do not have to worry if coworkers think you only have your job due to affirmative action. Okay, so that's something that uh, whites don't have to worry about. But uh, for professional blacks, that's always sort of an issue there, whether it's you know, actually the case or not. And uh, her number 19 is uh, if pulled over by police, by police, you do not have to worry about being singled out because of race. And here she leaves it at that, but in terms of things that I want to add, that I would say, particularly in light of what occurred in 2020 there, um, that, hey, whites have a privilege that you have to fear about being harmed or even killed by police uh, when encountering it. And so we have several incidents you know, during, during 2020, but this is uh, something that's been always been sort of uh, occurring in, in, in the black community. Uh, literally since, uh, since since inception of the country here, uh, not before, <clears throat> in terms of dealing with uh, police and, and authority. Um, another one that is not on her list that I would add is you know, whites don't have to give their children the talk. And there's actually different types of talk. So usually when people refer to the talk, uh, they're thinking about the talk that parents have to give their child in respect to the police, that when you encounter the police, that there's a certain uh, way you have to sort of behave um, in order to be safe. Um, but also, I think in terms of the talk, um, that is a talk that, that, that uh, African-American children are given, that in terms of, hey, on the one hand, uh, we want you to be the best that you can be and pursue whatever your dreams are, but you have to recognize that there's racial barriers that you're going to encounter and that you have to contend with. Uh, so I think that's a, another privilege that uh, she should have added in her list. Uh, this one I've sort of talked about, and this pertains to the weathering, that uh, whites don't have to worry about having pure health in America merely by being uh, non-white. And uh, I'm interested in the weathering because they pretty much talk about uh, this in respect to African Americans. But I'm curious, does it extend to other uh, non-white groups as well, too? Uh, but that's something uh, that, again, in the studies you're showing that that's something that's very specific to uh, African Americans. Uh, I got two more here. The next one is I can be a welfare and not worry about being racially stigmatized as lazy, undeserving, and a drain on society. And so here I'm thinking particularly back uh, to the 80s, even though I believe it's still prevalent, but uh, back in the 80s and any time there was sort of discussion of welfare, it was usually associated with African-Americans. And um, some of you can remember that in terms of talking about the welfare queen, uh, which was a myth anyways, there actually wasn't any sort of welfare queen. Um, but here in terms of the image of welfare, 
it, it, since basically the uh, 1960s been associated with African Americans. And um, again, uh, for going back to the myth, uh, that even those associated and images you see are associated with African Americans, it actually turned out to be the case that the most people on welfare are actually whites. So, you know, here, even though it was actually most, more, uh, mostly whites who are on welfare, uh, they don't have to worry about that sort of stigmatization. Yeah. And uh, my last one here is, is that I can speak a foreign language without fear of animosity or harm. And so here I have in mind specifically uh, something that occurred in September of 2020, that there were two Latino gentlemen in a restaurant and they were speaking Spanish and they were attacked just for speaking Spanish. At least that's how the, the news report uh, uh, sort of presented it. So that's something that I wouldn't have to worry about. But you know, here, I just want to throw at least one little thing here that you know, what, everything I'm talking about is not just in reference to African-Americans, but um, also can pertain to other um, non-whites as well too, okay? And um, yeah, we'll stop there. So any of this you want to talk about more about or you want to talk. So again, I only sort of hinted at talking about uh, you know, racial you know, justice and how white privilege pertains to it. Or even the arts. Uh, so I know that uh, uh, the, the audience watching this, a large amount of you are sort of the arts community. Um, I think that it's actually relevant to the, the arts as well, too. And we we'll to discuss that. Uh, we can do that as well, too. Cool. I'm going to come in here, but I'm going to make myself little. I don't want to be the big guy. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, um, yeah, uh, certainly white privilege. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's, I mean, that, first of all, thank you so, so incredibly much for that talk. It's really, uh, it was incredibly like, I, I, it's one of these, you know, doing everything online nowadays. Um, I, I just find myself like nodding along, going, yes, yes, oh, that's so, that's amazing. Um, but of course, you can't see any of us over here, like. You, uh, you be being affected by your words. So thank you for doing that talk. It really means a lot to us. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, maybe I would just start by asking that question you about. I know, I know this isn't your field, but we are a theater company, and um, these are the these are the kind of questions and issues that we're really interested in uh, engaging right now, especially during 2020. You know, when we we. Um, when when our our culture and our society is facing racial injustice, so um, so so apparently, uh, like what would you have any sort of advice or any sort of thoughts related to the way uh, artists are addressing this question or can address this question or uh, I mean particularly performing artists which, which is what we do but just just the arts in general if you have any sort of thoughts um, off the top of your head you want to join that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, I certainly do. Um, so here there is a connection between philosophy and the arts. And so here I can say this goes even all the way back to the ancient Greeks that we turned about Plato. Uh, he saw the arts as having a you know, very important educative role. Now, uh, mentioning Plato, he's probably not the best person because he was pretty hard on the arts. That, uh, <laughs> Didn't like the poets. Yeah, yeah. He said uh, Homer should be banned. Yeah, so we need to get rid of Homer. Uh, he teaches the wrong values to, to, to our young people. Right. Uh, so he probably had the best example, but at least we can say that he recognized that, you know, the arts have the impact on its audience, that in terms of educating them. And so here I would say in respect to, to white privilege, that in terms of the type of, say, uh, you know, plays or whatever events that you're putting on, and then I would even like this to say film and TV as well, too, that the arts is just not, you know, entertainment, that for whatever you're sort of producing, there's certain values that you're sort of conveying, certain messages that you're sort of conveying. So here, I would say that in terms of, uh, you know, in theater, in, in terms of the type of plays that you're going to put on, um, not only, say, consider, you know, diversity in terms of, hey, having, you know, black playwrights or whatever, but what kind of themes are you using? And is it the case that you're sort of perpetuating a certain, say, myth of America or what it is to be white, as opposed to considering that, hey, you know, I'm working from a particular perspective as a white middle class male? Uh, or, uh, you know, heterosexual male and things like that. You would be cognizant of that. And, and whether or not to say, it, you know, it actually does harm in terms of these other groups, but even just in, in addressing it is doing some sort of, sort of, sort of benefit. So I do think there's an educator role uh, in, in the arts. And uh, here I don't want to say, uh, say that you know, every production needs to have something that is addressing racial issues, but just in terms of, you know, the, just the general themes, 
um, is the case that you're excluding other groups uh, or, or say harming other groups by your sort of production. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You know, um, one of the things that I've heard a lot of talk about and that we've started talking about is kind of the difference between um, color blind casting and color aware casting, as they say in the this business, kind of like to, to kind of stop doing what you just spoke about, which is adding actually harm instead of saying, well, how does this, how does this impact the show? It's going to be interesting. And I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm as white as you get, you know, I've had all the privilege, you know, I was, I grew up kind of in what you talked about in some of those poor areas. So, but obviously I I've had a life filled with privilege because of who I am. Um, nobody's judged me from being from a poor background. I never had anybody judge me and think, oh, well, that's normal, <laughs> you know, or anything like that, which is, which is really great. But that's the, that's the one thing I was thinking is like, one of the privileges too in the theater is that all characters are assumed white unless otherwise noted. Right, and that, that's sort of the, 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 the norm or what it is to be human is sort of a default. And in terms of, in terms of, I'm glad you mentioned that in terms of colorblind uh, sort of sort of view. And this is also discussed in terms of law that colorblind policies that basically sort of ignores the actual real issues of, of racial injustice that sort of that sort of occurring. And so yes, so I can see how that's related to uh, the, the theater as well too. That we cast characters, and this person just a human. It doesn't matter that the fact that you know this is a black female, um, and they have a, their own sort of particular perspective. Um, associated with that, though, I'll say is the other end of it, that in terms of production that purposefully tr uh, sort of trying to address racial issues, but you're doing it from, say, a white understanding of it to an, to an extent, that's also something you need to be aware of. Um, and I did, I did not actually watch this movie in order to prepare for the, for the actual talk I'm giving. But, uh, yeah, last week I, on Netflix, I was watching a pretty good uh, film called the 40-year-old uh, virgin. Um, not to be confused with the Steve Carell movie, the 40-year-old virgin, okay? So this is the 40-year-old version. And it's a, it's a movie about it's a, a black female playwright. And she's working for, um, uh, well, she, she's a struggling uh, a playwright, but she winds up, to make a long story short, she winds up working with a white producer. And she has, her play is basically about uh, this, this couple who has a store in uh, Harlem. And the backdrop is sort of the gentrification of Harlem, but it's not the focal point. And so in talking to the, the white producer, the white producer says, wait a minute, you know, this, you should bring this, 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 this talk about gentrification up to the forefront. And in his mind, he's probably thinking that, okay, well, he's being socially conscious, but that totally is destroying the vision that the actual uh, playwright had where she was just more so concerned with showing the, hum so, you know, again, very uh, humanity in the context of the, the experience of these Afro-American um, uh, uh, yeah, 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 her characters, characters. So uh, you have to also be careful on the other end that, hey, that, you know, in terms of I'm going to purposely try to address racial issues and injustice, but then you, you're doing it from sort of a white framework. So one of the things I can say at the end of the, the film, I'm going to kind of spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the actual movie, we actually see the play. And so uh, at the end, uh, they, one of the things they have her do is include a white woman in the play in order to show the whole gentrification angle, and then there's you know there's tension and drama. They had their dispute, but at the end um, there's some sort of reconciliation between the two, and they hold hands, and that's how to resolve the racial issue, which is something that is uh, that she was kind of forced to include in order to appeal to a white audience, and then they show like some of the other black audience members like look, looking like what a quizzical you know look at what like, what the hell you know so. Yeah, so that's something that I think I'd be, be aware of too. That you know, hey, even if I am, again, you know, hey, I am intentionally trying to address racial issues and consider the experiences of of non-whites, but you're still sort of in the framework of doing it from, say, with white experience or white sort of take on um, racial injustice. Yeah, yeah. it seems like this is the 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 a, a way to uh, to address these issues. Um, in a theater company is to actually just include multiple voices in every step of the creative process as opposed to, um, you know, casting African-American actors, for instance, or uh, other actors of color. We need, we need people on all sort of levels in every stage of the production process to help uh, sort of engage these issues. And the other thing about white privilege, which I've 
it's something that I'm constantly thinking about, struggling with personally, is 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 being always aware of it. Because as a white man, it's really easy to forget that you're in a position of privilege. Um, and so, so one of the ways to to uh, try to actively be anti-racist, at least I'm telling myself lately, is to actually try to make choices, try to make choices that um, that are appropriate each time. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Um, so, so one of those things that we that one of the one of the ways that 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 uh, we can do that is to have other people involved in the process. I think this is sort of like for everyone involved in the arts generally, just like have include diversity. Diversity only makes things better, always makes things better. It seems to me. Um, but yeah, 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 that's, that's really fantastic. Um, does anybody out there have any questions that you want to ask Dr. Allen? Comment section is so quiet. We we probably don't have a whole lot of actors in there because otherwise it'd be going a mile a minute. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah. And it's our first, and people are more shy. That's true. Um, well, um, I if you do, do you have anything else, Christine? No, just a just a, a real thank you. And you know, I really actually did need to hear that last part that you talked about with coming from. You know, it's not just enough to be aware. You have to be uh, that like, oh, we're casting or we're really thinking about this. You have to be aware of how you might be harming it with your good thoughts and stuff like that. I mean, you said it so much more eloquently, but I thank you for that because that's, I think, was pretty important for me to hear as yeah, well. Definitely. Um, yeah, we, Dr. Allen, thank you so much for doing this with us. Um, and starting this conversation, which and it's just the beginning of a conversation that we'll continue to have, and um, hopefully you can be a part of that as much as possible. And uh, um, I, I, I learned a lot, and I hope that everyone else did too. Um, this video will be up, so people can check it out. It'll be on our on our uh, YouTube page. So I hope I hope more people come back and and join in. We're, this is the last call, y'all. If you will have any questions, type them in there now, because. And you know, while, while we were doing it, I just wanted to add that uh, I, 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 I was really looking forward to you know, doing this talk uh, because we need, we need to have more conversations like this. So mm -hmm. in terms of the hesitancy to just the, the people who sort of even want to talk about it, I mean, a certain part of the culture, I say anything that, you know, we're sort of uncomfortable sort of discussing, that's exactly what needs to be discussed. Um, and it, it, even in terms of, say, when, when, I, when I teach, <coughs> uh, students are sort of hesitant to sort of, sort of chime in. And you know, a part of it is they may be afraid of, like, hey, I may say the wrong thing. I may be considered, you know, they may think what I'm saying is racist or that, hey, I'm unintelligent or, or whatever. Um, here, just starting the conversation. And then here I can sort of add that, you know, depending on, you know, who you're talking to, yeah, it may actually get heated and people may have sort of, you know, certain feelings coming out and maybe some sort of tension. But that's actually good. Right. That you know, one of the things is that in terms of sort of the, 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 the sort of tension and talking about race, right? That's where the healing begins. And so my particular concern is is that you know, you know, really in terms of having a full discussion about race and the problem issue of race, like we haven't had that you know that here in, in America. Um, a lot of people think that okay, well we kind of, we passed a bunch of laws in the you know, civil rights era. Uh, that that automatically ended racism, and then that sort of ended you know, all these sort of attitudes and beliefs you have about you know, um, you know about non-whites or sort of you know, led to some racial harmony. But if you look back to say someone like Martin King Jr., I mean, he talks about this, and in the passing of the Civil Rights Act 1964, he says, "Well, this is only the beginning." That you know he had in mind, um, you know, sort of you know uh, his, his beloved community. That you know really, that in terms of addressing these issues. One has to be done in the homes of whites. That amongst whites, you have to talk about this, mm -hmm. um, and then it has to get and it, and it has to be gets to the case where yeah, it, you know, everyone can get together and sort of have these type of this type of discussions, and then that will lead to you know in ending sort of prejudices and attitudes and a little more uh, say you know racial uh, uh, you know harmony or or you want to call it. But yeah, so but so I'm I'm really glad that um, you, you know I was able to give this talk because I think we have more public talk. So this occurs a lot in academia, but in terms of say public conversations, things like this need to happen a lot more. Can uh, you see the question on the screen? Uh, yeah, that's Doctor Algazi Marcus is asking. Hi, William, and thanks for the wonderful talk. 
I often feel like an actor in the classroom. That's never truer. <laughs> how, how can we apply some of this to that? Like, so I'm talking about pedagogy and how we how can we talk about what you're talking about with regard to white privilege as it relates to pedagogy? Okay, okay, yes, yes. So, so in, in the classroom, one don't be afraid to to address it. So, in in, in the past semester, I did a section. Um, I was doing a, a whole class to you know, probably talking about philosophy of race next semester, but the you idea know, is, like, I believe, like a you know, a week or whatever, you know, talking about white privilege and uh, you know, and, and racism and you know, what systematic racism is and things like that. So, you know, first of all, you, you know, I noticed this, the students are, are kind of hesitant, um, and then also the fact that I'm professor, you know, in front, front of the actual classroom, not only are they sort of maybe sort of sort of you know, hesitant uh, because of the dispute of that, um, but. Uh, here, I would say that you introduce the topic and then let the students discuss amongst themselves. Because one of the things that, that, that I, I was really uh, surprised about, actually, um, was that when I had the students uh, go on the discussion board um, after class and have discussion, and they had, they, they, again, it was very respectful, and they had a really, really good discussion uh, about uh, white privilege, and a lot of things came out that were very um, uh, interesting in terms of some of you who hadn't even heard of it. Um, Others haven't even thought about that. They had some sort of privilege as far as you know, being white. And it was just a very good discussion amongst themselves. And people were being very honest. And, and, and I had uh, several uh, African-American students there as well, too. And I, I, was just, I really like the fact that, um, that they, they had a really good discussion amongst themselves. So here I'd say you know, introduce it to the topic, um, explain what it is, and then either in the class or online or whatever, have the students sort of you know, feel it out and, 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 and think about it. Um, but I will say that how I presented it, uh, I, I, and I did this on purpose in order to make them more comfortable talking about it. I uh, certainly didn't attack them, but I think by partly approaching the topic as I sort of did here, that this is about, say, self-knowledge and having knowledge of who you are as being raced, and also in terms of knowledge in terms of who you, be, who you are as, a, as being American, that sort of put in that sort of framework, and we'd already talked about you know uh, these issues beforehand, so that kind of like set it up. But you know, talking about it from the from the perspective of self knowledge, in addition to say issues of, of justice, and that this really is about you know you know know thyself. Um, I think that would that would that was helpful as well too, uh, in, in terms of hey you know this should be included in history classes and, and not just at the collegiate level. That this should be taught in elementary school. That uh, Oh, okay there. <laughs> you can see my um, my um, um, kanban. It just started at here. Right. <laughs> it was behind the curtain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, because it might have somebody's name on it, <laughs> but it's new. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, all, all I'm saying is, is that this, this is something that you shouldn't have to wait until college to even talk about that. You know, this should be introduced in uh, history classes. You just, you just you, again, not even just in terms of say American history. Um, that there should be a, a class just on say uh, the history of white supremacy. You know, here in America, um, and this leads to again about sort of changing you know our culture. Um, something I want to do some more research in actually is in Germany. Uh, it, after World War II, up to the 1960s, we understand that in terms of talking about um, about the Nazi and in the German involvement and in, in terms of uh, you know, uh, genocide, uh, that it wasn't discussed amongst, amongst the adults. And then not until the 1960s did that sort of new generation, they sort of bring that to the fore, and they had their own sort of, I guess, like cultural revolution in that sort of respect, where um, now that in terms of teaching about uh, just, again, about the, about the, you know, the, 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 the genocide of Jews. That's a course in and of itself, a course that's taught to you know, the elementary school. Um, you know, that's something that we should, we should have here. I mean, in terms of discussion, there ain't sort of discussion about, about, about history uh, of this country and uh, other disciplines. It has to include talking about, you know, about race and, 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 and white supremacy. Um, and then, you know, through that, you know, it, it becomes something that's sort of part of, you know, who we are as, um, Americans, and then that would help as well too. But yeah, yeah, that's my suggestion. I mean, we're you know the collegiate level. You can at least start at the collegiate level, but I think this should even be taught in elementary school and you know, get in there as well too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was. If it looks like I was looking at my watch a second ago, I was actually 
getting a message from Amy Gottfried. I have, a, I have a, one of these watches, and I got a text saying she can't get she can't get in there, but she did want to say that this is amazing and thank you so much. So, pass okay. that on. Um, yeah, she's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah, that's true. If you're not logged in, my sister tried to do a message, and um, if you're not logged in as your person, if you're just watching it on YouTube or I'm not sure about Facebook, they won't let you comment unless you're, okay. you have to actually log in to comment and not everybody goes and logs in as themselves. You know, they're just so. Well, anyway, I, I think that um, this has been an amazing talk. And and once again, I just want to say thank you. Um, it's uh, I, I can't wait till we can hang out in person and do this kind of stuff and have these conversations and um, continue this process. Um, but what a great night. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, um, with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Check back with us, and and uh, and we'll have more of these in the future. Thanks, Dr. Right. Allen. Right. Great. Right. Everyone, take care. Thank right. you. Right.